so, so Tatercept is a subcutaneous injection, and, and so that means that, the, that it's a liquid that gets injected underneath the skin. And I'm going to take a little bit of time to explain how it works to you, because it's not straightforward, or how we think it works anyway. The, the underlying science that this is based on actually came out of the lab that, that I was lucky enough to work in for, for the better part of a de decade, and that's that's a guy called Professor Nicholas Morell, or Nick Morell, and he's just retired. So this is a really great story because Nick has spent 15 years trying to understand the genetic form of the disease. That's, that's predominantly mutations in a protein called bone morphogenetic protein type 2 receptor. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but BMPR2. And what we demonstrated many years ago was that, that there seems to be a balance of proteins related to that pathway that regulate the vessel and, and how healthy it is, the lung vessel, and, and in fact, that's the underlying cause of the disease. So Cetatercept works by essentially inhibiting some of the things that, that negatively regulate that protein pathway, or so basically it, in, it inhibits the inhibitors. And, and so we think it rebalances the signaling, and, and, and that's work that came out. In fact, Rachel Davies, uh, who works in Hammersmith, did that work well over a decade ago. And 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 so the, the great thing for us is that has closed a loop of, we've looked in animals and cells over many years to see is there ways you can target BMPR2. And, and, and so the answer to that appears to be a very clear and positive yes. So it's really exciting, particularly because so Tatercept doesn't work like any other drug that we have available for pulmonary hypertension. Most of our drugs work by opening the vessel up. So they deal with the consequences of the disease, not the cause. So it's the fact that the vessel is, is, is essentially narrowed because it's constricted and it's overgrown in an attempt to be able to cope with pressure rather than the actual thing that's caused the pressure in the first instance. So Cetatercept works by addressing the underlying cause of disease and not the consequence. And I think that's the most exciting thing about it. So as we're recording this, we are literally only two weeks out from the announcement that the phase three trial of Cetatercept was positive. But what we haven't seen yet is the actual data from the trial. So it's, it's still early days and we, we don't know the specifics of how well the therapy works. We know from the smaller trial, and that's what we call a phase two trial, that there was a very significant effect in most of the things that were measured and that was in a population of patients who were already on therapy. So the expectation is that the phase three study, and the phase three just means the big study that the regulators require to be able to ask for a license in case, so in other words to get the therapy actually approved, uh, we, we were expecting a similar result but we haven't actually seen the specifics yet. So the reason it's important that we haven't seen the results is that, 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 it's, that the regulators require a submission with all the specifics of the trial. So from a very practical perspective, nothing's going to happen immediately because the company will have to put their submission in to ask the regulators for approval for the therapy to be licensed. And, and that can take a number of months, uh, and as we've all seen during the pandemic, for example, with the vaccines, and they get expedited very quickly. Uh, once we see the results and have an understanding of who might benefit from this, then regulators around the world will start to think about who they will be happy to be treated with. So, so this isn't going to happen immediately. There's going to be a bit of a delay, and there are still some ongoing trials, in fact, trying to clarify that question of who benefits from this. So although Sotatercept will not be available for quite some time within the NHS, there are trials open and recruiting still around the country. And so if patients are interested in Sotatercept, they should go to their local centre and see whether they're eligible for some of the trials that are either open or about to open. It's a difficult one. It's not going to be, you know, it will be months, but to the year's ends of months. Uh, when we talk about regulatory submissions, it can often take a year or two for that to go from the process of a trial completing to a healthcare service agreeing to a price and reimbursing. And, and, and so it might be a little while before Cetatacept is available outside of the framework of a trial. And it's important that we're, we're, we're honest and realistic about that. But we haven't seen the data yet. And, and it partly depends on what the data shows. If there's a really strong case, sometimes 
the regulators will act quicker. Okay. Okay. So for me personally, this is this is one of the most exciting things that's happened in the last twenty years in in in, in our field, and 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 I've got skin in the game because you know I was involved in some of the work in a in, in a modest way. But the the demonstration that we can not just treat the consequence of disease, but we can actually address the underlying cause, is just the the the, the most important I think bit of research that's been done in pulmonary hypertension for well over a decade and it will open up the field to all sorts of new additional ways to target the same pathway so I don't think it's just going to stop with satatar step to expect this to be a now a very rich vein of research that, that we'll be exploring for this next decade.